Right now, I want to talk today about the way the scaling relations arise between critical exponents and also uh, give you a little bit of uh, an introduction to the Ginzburg-Landau theory of phase transitions and then go on from there. So let us first go back, take a look at uh, what we deduced from the from mean field theory in the Ising class. We found that I did not calculate this, but this exponent, the specific heat exponent is 0 in mean field theory. I did not compute this, it is a trivial calculation, but I did not do it, but it is uh, alpha equal to 0 is the result in mean field theory. The magnetization exponent or order parameter exponent is a half, the susceptibility exponent is 1 and the critical isotherm exponent is uh, 3. Remember that uh, here m is h to the one third, right? So that was a relation here, or m goes like h cubed. That was a relation. Uh, sorry, h goes like m cubed was a relation, and then uh, I introduced two other exponents. One was nu for the correlation length, and this was a half, and uh, this exponent was zero essentially, although again we did not talk about it in great detail and I said there are relations between these exponents here. Now the way they were arrived at originally was empirically, completely empirically and today we have an understanding of uh, the way, why these things are the way they are from mean field, from, uh, from field, from a field theoretic approach to it from the renormalization group. But in a sense, it is ultimately experiment, it is ultimately basic experimental evidence, okay. So through the 1960s, people very patiently collated a lot of data and then finally, Widom proposed the following scaling function. Uh, remember the equation of state we had for the Ising model and his problem, his point was the following, uh, so it is it was followed shortly after that by other proposals for scaling more sophisticated proposals by other people such as Kadanoff and so on, culminating in the renormalization group approach of Wilson and Fisher and others to calculate critical exponents as a function of dimensionality and the number of components of the order parameter, okay. That is a sort of crown jewel of equilibrium statistical mechanics. But the idea of Widom scaling was the, was very simple. His point was that if you took the magnetization m in the critical region, then this was equal to on the one hand 0 for t greater than 0. Remember that t is uh, t minus tc over tc and but to, it was equal to minus t to the power beta apart from some constant functions etc. in this fashion for t less than 0. So this was the magnetization and I should write this down here in the absence of a field. So one has a statement for m at t and h equal to 0 in the field. On the other hand, if you looked at m at 0 and h for small h, oh let me, let me, let me mention here, I should have done this, that this is h, the field divided by k Boltzmann t, which is rescaled the magnetic field by kt and that I call little h here. You did it implicitly in your lab I did it implicitly, but since you pointed out that there is a 1 over t, let us call it little h, that is the standard notation for it. Now you could ask what happens if you on the critical isotherm, this stuff itself, this goes like h to the power 1 over delta yeah. and delta was 3 in mean field theory, okay. So is there a way to combine these two relations and get them out in one formula and then one expression? And that is what Widom did. What he did was to show that the huge pile of experimental data fitted the following scaling rule. The function m 
of t and h which would ordinarily be a function of two independent variables becomes now dependent only on one particular combination. So this thing here is equal to t to the power beta times something called a scaling function. So this f and this is for t positive so let us call it f plus h over t to the delta for t greater than 0 and it is minus t to the beta so it is just a dependence on the modulus some other scaling function of h over t to the delta minus t to the delta for t less than 0. And these functions f plus and minus are called scaling functions. So his point was asymptotically close to the critical region where m is 0, h is 0, t is 0, asymptotically close, all the data collapse onto this kind of functional form here, okay. Where this is some power, this is some power, this is some power, etc. Now capital delta has nothing to do with little delta. He said there is a power delta such that you fit it in and you choose a proper delta and all the data collapse onto this sort of formula. The question is what is this uh, capital delta etc. So delta is called uh, the so called gap exponent okay. but now let us see if it fits this. How would you get that? You would set f e h equal to 0 and then you immediately see that oh, first of all it is clear that since m of t minus h equal to minus m of t h, if you reverse the field the magnetization simply reverses at a fixed value the temperature it is clear that both f plus or minus of uh, whatever the argument is of uh, u equal to minus f plus or minus of u. Whatever be the argument here the scaling functions of oh, minus u. So the scaling function is an odd function in each case. Moreover, above Tc for T positive, you get a 0 here, right, at h equal to 0. So it is guaranteed if you take f plus of 0 equal to 0. But the odd character forces it to be 0. Pardon me? Not necessarily. That is the point. Not necessarily. Think about this. It is not z, it is the odd character does not force it to be 0 because there could be a finite discontinuity, right. I mean, if you have a function that is odd, then there are three possibilities. If it is continuous, then at 0 argument, it is 0. If it is got an infinite discontinuity like 1 over x, it is an odd function, but it is got an infinite discontinuity, that is perfectly all right. But it could also have a finite discontinuity like the magnetization has, right. So it could do this and indeed that is what is happening here. That is an odd function but it has got a finite discontinuity and therefore does not vanish at the origin. That is what the magnetization does, the spontaneous magnetization, okay. So what we require is that uh, f minus of 0 is not equal to 0, some constant not equal to 0. Then you are fine with this, you get this immediately, right. But the question is what is this delta? For that one looks at the susceptibility. So since we know that chi t equal to delta m over delta h which is 1 over k Boltzmann t 
delta m over delta h at constant uh, temperature and at h equal to 0, the 0 field susceptibility. What you need to do is to differentiate this on both, both these functions here. This will give you the paramagnetic susceptibility and this gives you the ferromagnetic susceptibility in the critical region just below. Then assuming that the slope of this functions at 0 argument is finite, not 0 or infinity, it immediately follows that uh, the susceptibility chi t goes like t to the minus gamma which from here will go like t to the power beta minus delta because if I take out this function and differentiate it to first order in H since this follows 0 at 0 argument and I differentiate it you get a t to the delta in the denominator when I differentiate with respect to H so you get this relation here. So that immediately tells you that this gap exponent is not anything new but delta equal to beta plus gamma. But now let us look at what happens if h is equal to 0, uh, sorry if t equal to 0. Uh, so there you got to be a little more careful, we want this result at little t equal to 0. So how is that going to happen? You want to make sure that on the critical isotherm at little t equal to 0 you get this cubic curve, that is what you want and that will happen provided you see it can only happen because this fellow blows up at little t equal to 0, right. So the only way that can be saved is that there is a leading behavior here which is some power which vanishes when taken with this. So if f of uh, u, f plus or minus of u goes like u to some power as u tends to 0. then m of t h goes as t tends to 0 goes to t to the power beta and this is h to the lambda over t to the power delta lambda which is t to the power beta minus delta lambda h to the lambda. And that is the same as h to the 1 over delta provided lambda equal to 1 over delta and beta is equal to lambda delta so that this goes away, the t dependence cancels out, that is the only possibility. But delta is beta plus lambda, so it says therefore we have our second scaling relation. Our first one was uh, that delta equal to beta plus gamma and now we discovered if I put in uh, 1 over delta here, beta plus gamma equal to beta delta. So you get this uh, extra relation here. Hmm? Therefore these are not independent exponents, once you give me the others then this uh, once you give me beta and gamma you, you know delta, okay. This is independent of mean field theory because this is extracted from experiment, okay. The actual numerical values of these are irrelevant, the point is therefore em empirically you will get numerical values for those but the point is across systems, across different values of these exponents you still have these relations. Of course the scaling functions will change in different cases and so on but that does not matter. The point is that there is scaling at the critical point in the sense that uh, whenever you have a function of several variables if you have a generalized homogeneous function 
then you have what is called scaling because it means you can reduce the number of variables by one depending on how many combinations you can form. You can reduce the number of independent variables and here you have reduced it from a function of t and h separately to apart from this power a single function of this combination out here. Okay. Now one can go on with this. One can ask what happens in other in the case of other exponents. For instance, if you look at the let us see what are the other exponents one can talk about. If you look at a thing like a free energy, the singular part because there is always a piece added like what I called phi naught earlier which is not singular, it is an uninteresting piece. The free energy per unit volume, I will call it little f, a suitable free energy. This guy scales like t to the power 2 minus alpha times again some scaling function. Let me just call it f once again of uh, h over t to the power delta in the critical region. Okay. Then the susceptibility, uh, sorry, then m goes like uh, delta f apart from the 1 over t factor etc over delta h out here and for small values of h near 0 this goes like t to the power 2 minus alpha minus delta times f of 0 right. Uh, sorry uh, delta h times f prime of h whatever whatever that be okay. and of course m will vanish in the critical region on the critical isotherm when h is 0 that is perfectly okay. But now the susceptibility chi t goes like there might be a minus sign here in the free energy but this is irrelevant. This goes like delta m over delta h apart from the 1 over t etc and this is now going to go like uh, t to the power 2 minus alpha minus 2 delta times f double prime whatever. So what does that give us? Of course part of the information we already know that says T minus two uh, T minus two minus alpha minus delta is equal to beta because that is what the M should do. Right? And now chi t this thing should be gamma because that is the susceptibility uh, minus gamma. Two minus alpha minus two delta equal to minus gamma. Or you put beta plus gamma here, it does not matter, it is exactly the same thing. So, these two together will imply alpha plus twice beta plus gamma equal to 2. This is called the Rushbrook equality. So, we will add that to this alpha plus 2 beta plus gamma equal to 2 value. They could, then you could ask what about uh, the green function, the correlation function itself because this was really what, where everything came from. It turns out that this g that we talked about as a function of r it is a vector r but we are looking at the dependence on this variable r t and h here. This is the correlation function suitably fine coarse grained and integration etc etc done. This guy has a scaling form 1 over r to the power d minus 2 plus eta 
times again this I use the same symbol f for this f it is a function of 3 variables to start with but once you have this generalized scaling it is a function only of 2 combinations. So it turns out to be a function of r t to the nu and our old friend h over t to the delta again empirical evidence. So from this exactly as we did before we can extract further relations among the exponents. For instance and I will just write those results down you have a result which says 2 minus alpha equal to nu d where d is the dimensionality remember dimensionality is appearing here in this place this is the only relation among all these for which the dimensionality is physically appearing it is called hyperscaling but it is a consequence of scaling finally and also you get gamma equal to nu times 2 minus eta. Now mean field exponents will not satisfy this because mean field theory is true only in above the upper critical dimensionality which for the Ising class is 4. But if you substitute mean field exponents in 3 dimensions they, you get answers for alpha nu etc which are independent of dimensionality. If you put 0 here and you put a half here and 3 here clearly it is not satisfied. But if you put 0 here and half here and 4 there then it is satisfied because that is the upper critical dimensionality perfectly fine. All the others will be satisfied okay. Wherever dimensionality is involved mean field theory will flunk of course if you are below the upper critical dimensionality hmm? you have to go beyond it. So the question is how do you do this how does one go beyond all this hmm? the answer which culminated in the renormalization group is rather long and tortuous but let us let me uh, show you at least an indication of what the starting point is it is as follows we would first like to include uh, fluctuations in the theory but before that we would like to find a systematic way of getting the relations we have such as the fact that for the order parameter m above Tc there is one solution below Tc there are two stable solutions and one unstable solution and so on. We would like to get this from some principle which looks like a variational principle or some minimization of some energy functional here. This energy functional is just a generalization of what I wrote down here for the Ising model made a little fancy. What one does is instead of looking at individual magnetic moments one argues that in the critical region whole patches of linear dimension xi form where the systems get the system gets ordered. And in the paramagnetic phase there are as many patches were down as up but as you get keeping as field in the positive direction as you get near the critical point these fellows grow at the expense of the other domains and finally the whole system in the thermodynamic limit the correlation length diverges and you have uh, incipient magnet up hmm? okay. Now what one then does is to take this m and define a coarse grain magnetization for each patch of this size by writing m uh, the size of the patch is linear dimension xi the correlation length of r you define this as 1 over the number of uh, spins n xi at the center at the point r this is the center of it is the point r here summation i element of the patch or block S i. So that is a coarse grain magnetization you define okay. I am going to drop this subscript here just call it a field and then you construct this Landau free energy I should call it a functional of some kind which is geared so as to give me in equilibrium all the solutions that I had 
if I took the minimum of this function here. So this is equal to an integral d d of r times you want a quadratic term and you want a quartic term. So conventionally one writes this as a times t m squared of r. This little t is t minus t c for reasons which we saw. This function, this coefficient has to change sign from positive to negative as you cross the critical point. So you get this splitting of the minimum from a higher order minimum to two minima and a maximum in between. By symmetry, this we argued already in the absence of a field, there is no linear term. There are no odd powers of m by symmetry in the absence of a field. Plus the next term for stability, one writes b m to the 4 of r is the next term. And if you put in a field, you could put in now an inhomogeneous field. It does not matter because it is still coupled the same way. So minus m of r h of r. Put a little h, yeah. In d dimensions, in an arbitrary number of dimensions. This is a positive number A, that is a positive number B and its temperature dependence is irrelevant in the critical region. Then the statement is the thermodynamical equilibrium state is going to be obtained by taking the minimum of this L with respect to M. We will soon convert it to at least briefly convert it to a field theory because what you really want to compute is the partition function which means you must have Z is e to the minus beta times this quantity here. This is going to act like beta times this acts like some effective Hamiltonian if you like. So you do e to the minus beta L and you have to trace. But trace over what? You have a continuous order parameter here. So you trace over all configurations of this order parameter. So it will be a path integral or a functional integral over all these guys. But before that let us see how to get the equilibrium solutions. So equilibrium solutions would imply delta L over sorry imply. Now I need a functional derivative okay. this is now L is a functional of m of r and I want this functional derivative here, okay. A functional is a function of a function in the simplest uh, thing, okay. And how do you do that? Well, I presume you know the simplest rules for functional uh, differentiation. Um, is this familiar or sh should I mention them? Can I go ahead and assume them? Yes. Is there anyone who does not know what a functional derivative is? If so, say it now. Okay. Well, the properties we need are very, very simple. We need to define, well, let us not make a mystery of it. Suppose you have a functional of f of x, a function of a function, right? This guy is a functional of m of r, okay. Then the way you define delta f divided by delta little f of x in this fashion, right, is to write this as uh, f of phi of y plus epsilon delta of x minus y minus f phi of y divided by epsilon and take the limit as epsilon tends to 0 and this guy is delta f.
right. So, in particular this rule tells you that before we find this, this rule tells you that uh, the functional derivative of f of x or f of y with respect to f of x equal to delta of x minus y. Right. Therefore, if you have uh, integral dy f of y and you do the derivative of that with respect to f of x here, you take this in there, get a delta function and the integral is 1. So, this is equal to 1. that is the only rule you need to know. So, we can now differentiate this guy okay. and what would you get? Uh, Let us see this here delta L uh, delta L over delta M of R equal to. So, let us make all these R primes R prime R prime R prime and start differentiating. So, I put it in here, I get twice m of r prime out here and then I need the functional derivative of m of r prime with respect to m of r which is delta of r minus r prime. I do the integral, I get a t times m of r with a factor 2. So, it is just like ordinary differentiation twice a t m of r plus 1 one half b m squared of r minus h of r. And the equilibrium solution is given by setting this equal to 0 and you have to ensure that the second derivative is also got the right sign. So, it is at a minimum. Ah, sorry, this is BM cube. Thanks. I t yeah, two on top. So now, in the absence of the field out here, you're going to get your usual properties for a given sign of t. Now the point is that uh, this is not enough. You've neglect. You've not taken into account fluctuations. You need to have uh, two things are going to happen. If you have an inhomogeneity, you could incidentally get stuck at some local minimum, but thermal fluctuations will get you out of there to a global minimum. But you need to put in a term which will take care of spatial variations. Now, this is an unphysical model as it stands because it is exactly like saying that I have no connection between neighboring patches at all. It is too local. It certainly costs a lot of energy by way of when you have a up patch with a down patch at the boundary at the domain wall, you have a rapid change of the magnetization from up to down. So, it is going to cost you in gradient energy. It is just like taking a string and when you vibrate this string, there is a certain cost in energy if the string goes up and down too many times, a gradient energy which is the reason why if you have a very short wavelength, you have a higher frequency, those are higher energy modes, cost you more energy to excite those modes. So, the same kind of argument, but we would have to improve this functional here and how are we going to do that? We need to take into account a term which takes not just m at one patch, but m at the neighboring patch as well. So, some gradient of m is going to appear. And what is the simplest form that you can talk about? Well, since it is going to be cannot be linear in M, it has to be quadratic at the very least. It has got to be symmetric under M goes to minus M. So, it has got to be even powers of M and the simplest such term is a gradient squared. So, you add to this
a half or again for differentiation purposes some coefficient gamma gradient of m of r Oh, gamma is an exponent, right? So let me call it. I don't know what the standard notation for this is. C for now, because I'm going to get rid of it. Plus, this. Okay. I'm going to scale out with this C in a second. This is not the standard way in which this free energy is written. I'm going to scale it, scale it out. So what does this do to this equation here? There you got to be a little careful. You have to find this is exactly like the energy of a vibrating string, except there's a non-linearity here. Otherwise, everything is linear, as you can see. So, what's the functional derivative of this term? If I differentiate it, you're going to have uh, twice. So it's c over two times twice gradient of m itself times the functional derivative of the gradient. So times delta, so everything is r prime, right, r prime. So let us write this out. This term here, if I take the functional derivative, gives me d d r c over 2 into d d r prime twice gradient of m of r prime times uh, delta over delta m of r gradient m of r prime. But these two operators operations commute with each other. So I can put this inside there and put a delta function. So I get rid of this and write a gradient of delta of r minus r prime. But you can't directly handle the gradient of a delta function, so you do an integration by parts. And when you do that, there is a surface term which vanishes in this case because there is a delta function sitting inside the bulk. So with a minus sign, this gradient acts on this. So it's del dot del on m of r times a delta function. So you have del squared of m of r prime times delta of r minus r prime. You integrate, you get del squared of m of r itself. So this term becomes In the absence of a field, you get an equation which has got an m cube term out here. Otherwise, you would normally have a del squared plus constant times this guy, which is like the Hemmholtz equation, but you now have an extra m cubed here. It is a nonlinear equation. And you put in an external field, you have further complications here. Okay. Now, there are many names for this equation but we are still not done because, oh, oh, by the way, the, the way it is when you do the renormalization group, the scaling that you do to get rid of this whole thing is you divide through by C all the way through. So you have A T divided by C out here as a coefficient and you redefine your M by taking, you want to make this uh, thing here, so you make, you want to make this half gradient of whatever is squared. So you set, uh, you want to find e to the minus beta L and write it uh, as equal to e to the minus uh, effective Hamiltonian. So you got a beta C, so you write square root of C beta times M of R equal to your order parameter field phi of R. Okay. 
and then this H effective with the identification of constants here. Let me write it in standard notation. So, H effective R half gradient phi of R squared plus uh -huh. the conventional notation is R naught phi squared plus one fourth U naught phi four in the absence of a field. This is like a 5 4 field theory. So, it starts at this point out here, and then you can do dimensional analysis, find out what are the dimensions of R naught, U naught, etcetera, etcetera. This guy is like 1 over length squared, and so on. Okay. So, that is a piece of algebra I am not going to get into. What I want to talk about instead is how does the system escape from a local minimum and fall into a global minimum? That is how the, what the equilibrium state is. Okay. Because just setting this equal to 0 is not going to tell you whether it is a local minimum or a global minimum. Right? So, you argue as follows. You say that there is a time dependence in the problem and now you say you have m of r and t. So, an instantaneous configuration, field configuration will change with time according to this equal to. On the right hand side, you say look, the further away it is from a minimum, the faster it relaxes. So, this relaxes with some coefficient, let us call it gamma. I used up little gamma for an exponent and what is left? is delta L over delta M of R. That is a single relaxation time kind of approximation. You say there is a relaxation of this. If this is 0, then of course, this does not change at all. But otherwise, the deviation of this fellow from the minimum value from 0, because at the equilibrium this is 0, will tell you how fast this changes, the M changes. Okay. However, you still have not allowed for random fluctuations here okay, because the thermal fluctuations are random. So, this by itself is like writing a Langevin equation with a friction term, but without putting in the random force which you need for consistency. So, you put in now plus a zeta of uh, r comma t, a noise white noise. This is now a Langevin equation. Okay. It is called the time dependent Ginzburg Landau equation. But we know that such an equation, we need to make some assumptions about this, we are going to give us further information. right? So, what are the assumptions we are going to make about this noise? It is now a field, it is now a configuration, but a random field. So, we are going to assume that average zeta equal to 0, zeta of r t correlation with r prime t prime equal to now some subtleties creep up here depending on whether the order parameter is conserved or not conserved and I am not going to get into that here now, but in this problem this magnetization problem this thing is equal to some constant which is 2 d times a delta function of r minus r prime delta of t minus t prime. So, it is really random noise in this fashion. This is a d dimensional <laughs> delta function. Yeah. To go further, even that is not enough. You have to do what you did in the Langevin equation. We have to make some assumption about the nature of the probability distribution of this zeta here. 
So, you assume that it is Gaussian, that the field configurations are distributed in a Gaussian manner about some equilibrium value, some fixed value of the configuration. And then you have a Langevin equation. But again you discover there is a consistency condition you would have to satisfy between this and this and sure enough you would discover that D equal to 2 gamma K Boltzmann T. This is our old friend the fluctuation dissipation theorem. But once you make a Gaussian approx for this, Gaussian probability distributions, then we are all set. We could write down a Fokker Planck equation for the probability distribution of the field configurations themselves. And what would that probability distribution be? Well, you would have to ask what is the probability of a configuration zeta of r comma t. This is of course equal to right, what we mean by a probability distribution in any case is the expectation value of the delta function of that random variable at any value it assumes. So, this is equal to the expectation value over what I will mention in a second of a delta function of zeta of uh, oh, what did I write m, m we are looking at the field here we are looking at all this is gone this is phi sorry everything has been scaled out of phi is delta of phi of r t minus the, uh, sorry I need better notation delta function of this configuration minus phi Okay, this is the solution of the Langevin equation for a given zeta noise and you want this to be equal to that solution. So, you put a delta function here and this is over the field configuration zeta. So, that is this p and it will satisfy a functional Fokker Planck equation as you can ex as you can expect. Everything that you had as ordinary derivatives will become functional derivatives and so on. I am not going to write that down just very makes the notation messy, but I am just trying to motivate what happens here. Okay. And then you look at the time scales, you look at the critical slowing down and dynamical indices and so on. So, this is where uh, dynamic critical phenomena start at this point. So, it is a very straightforward uh, extrapolation of whatever we did for a single particle, we did a Langevin equation, we had certain basic ideas, those ideas are just extrapolated to a field theory. So, one degree of freedom being replaced by field. A degree of freedom being replaced by continuous set field and we do not care how many spatial dimensions it has or how many components it has. So, the notation gets messier and messier, but the basic intrinsic ideas are very straightforward out here. Okay. So, at this level it is still we write it down as a phenomenological thing, but now uh, it becomes serious business because the renormalization group analysis of this equation you start by identifying physical dimensions, doing quote unquote dimension analysis on this, identifying anomalous dimensions and then what happens? Uh, you look at uh, renormalization uh, which is a fancy way of saying you try to scale things up, write things in a scale invariant manner and um, study the flow so to speak of this uh, transformation and look at its fixed points. So, very in a nutshell that is really what uh, 
critical point, uh, critical phenomena analysis is all about. But the time dependent part is also a straightforward exp uh, exp extension of whatever we do in most elementary cases here. So I said right in the beginning that the Langevin equation would serve as a paradigm, as a kind of model for uh, much more serious problems, non-trivial problems. And these are examples of such problems. Here, I, we didn't talk about hydrodynamics at all. We, didn't, we just had a short excursion into ki kinetic theory, but we didn't get to the hierarchy, the BBGKY hierarchy and so on. But I wanted to give a flavor for uh, the way this subject is approached, at least some aspects of it are approached. So I think I'll stop here now. <laughs>